Let's talk about the DEF CON Capture the Flag Finals 2018. I never thought I would actually participate in this prestigious event as the best teams in the world travel to Las Vegas for it. Even just qualifying for it means your team belongs to the top in the world. But I wasn't there for that reason, I was only here because the German team easily point repeat collaborated with other German teams. We played a few CTFs together for practice and then to qualify for the finals. We couldn't even agree on a name so you might have seen us as Germany's next drop model, Crosstrack or at the finals as Sauercloud. As you know my channel has a lot of videos about solving CTF challenges and if you don't really know what CTFs are I have linked two videos here. But I have only ever played Jeopardy or Wargame style CTFs where you have single challenges to solve. And they have the problem that nowadays you just need big teams of skilled people if you want to compete for top ranking. Because certain challenges can just take a single person over 15 hours to solve. And in a CTF with dozens of challenges you need manpower. But the DEF CON Finals CTF is different. It's an attack and defense CTF which I have never played before. So how does that work? So attack and defense CTFs can vary how they work and this year's CTF also had different rules and ideas were tweaked to balance the game. It's important that we look at the rules and the setup for this CTF closely so that you can understand the nuances and strategies. So don't take this as a general description of how every A and D CTF works, but they do share some similarities. And we are able to make some assumptions about that for preparations. So typically an attack and defense CTF works like this. Every team gets a machine. This machine runs services, so it runs programs that can be exploited. Exploiting means, like with every CTF challenge, your goal is it to steal the flag on said system. So that might be a flag.txt file or whatever with a unique flag to prove you got access to the system. So your team has to analyze, reverse engineer and eventually create the exploit to get the flag from a target system. That's like every other Jeopardy CTF game. But the twist is that every team has such a vulnerable machine running. So you have to use your exploit against all the other machines. By doing so you are stealing the flag from each team and that gives points. Now there are a few additional things that make attack and defense very different from regular Jeopardy. First the defense part. Teams can defend themselves from exploits. How this is done can vary from CTF to CTF but often you are required to patch the vulnerability or maybe you can even deploy firewall rules. This means while you are analyzing and hunting for the vulnerability to create your own exploit, at the same time you think about and eventually implement a patch for your own machine. But of course you want to prevent so called superman defenses. You could just kill your own service or completely block any input or just remove entire functionalities of the program in order to prevent other teams from stealing your flag. So you can see that defense can be very creative and quickly can become unfair. Thus often a so called SLA service level agreement is implemented. So that means a game server will constantly execute test cases against your service to ensure that your service is still running as intended. But even then a clever defender could try to create a patch that allows the game server tests but blocks all the other players. You can imagine that defense ideas and strategies can go wild and to keep the game fair you try to prevent that. How exactly DEFCON CTF did that we will learn shortly. Another important detail is the concept of the game tick, a clock. So if you would just have to steal the flag once from all teams there would be a race to the first exploit and then all the teams get exploited, that's it. That doesn't sound too exciting. So typically the game is ran in ticks or intervals. For example every 5 minutes the flags on all teams machines are exchanged. So you run your exploits every 5 minutes against all teams and hope to still find a vulnerable service. Then you take the flags, submit them to the scoreboard and it then awards you with points for how many flags you got this round. This actually makes attack and defense exciting. So you are sitting there and you see that a team has a working exploit against you. They get points each round for it. So now you are trying to fix the bug in order to stop them from gaining those points and then crazy strategies might emerge. Could you exploit your own service and submit the flag yourself for one additional point? 
Is your team the only one with a working patch? Do you want to share the patch with other teams so that the current top team can't gather even more points? It can go crazy. Then sometimes you have access to the whole network traffic. Sometimes you can log traffic yourself or the game itself logs it and shares the PCAPs. But that means now traffic analysis becomes super important. You could maybe steal exploits from other teams by simply replaying the packets. You could try to extract flags that teams have leaked through the network traffic and submit it yourself. And to protect your own exploits, you now start to think about obscuring your exploits in the traffic. Maybe you know bugs in Wireshark that you can include in your traffic to make analysis for other teams harder. Okay, so now you have a good general idea. And based on this, teams prepared for the DEF CON finals. Basically every team has a software developed to automatically execute exploits against each team every tick so you don't want to do that by hand, as well as then taking the flags that are returned and automatically submit them to the scoreboard. You also don't want to gather and submit maybe dozens of flags every 5 minutes by hand. Here's for example the flag submitter service from the team Macaroni, the Italian team. And you can tell that some teams might totally over engineer them with fancy stats and so forth and maybe even develop a lot more tools, for example to analyze PCAPs. Maybe you don't want to use Wireshark for various reasons. So as mentioned in the previous video, our team got a suite in Caesars Palace to play from because there is only space for 8 people at the table in the CTF area. So in order to connect everybody, quite some network engineering had to be done. And luckily our team had some awesome people who took care of that. I don't know exactly the details, but it all worked flawlessly. But I've heard that one person stayed up all night to get it working. Thanks so much. For internet we actually had planned to use an LTE router but the connection was just terrible. We had of course Wi-Fi and I think even Ethernet in the hotel room but that network was also terribly slow. So I think in the end we abused the Ethernet connection of the smart TV in the room. That network was apparently separate and you could get really good speeds. And I believe we were not the only team who figured that out. I think here on this picture from the post CTF shellfish party in their team suite, you can also see some network cables hooked up around the TV. Super funny. Before the CTF, every team got 8 bags with a badge for DEF CON and some other goodies. Let's have a quick look at that. The most important thing was the golden CTF coin. It was used to allow you into the CTF area and it was just kinda special. It had the DEF CON 26 CTF logo on the front and the logo of the Order of the Overflow on the back. That is the name of the team who organized this year's CTF. In previous years it was organized by the Legit Business Syndicate and this year by the Order of the Overflow. So that was their first time and I think they did an awesome job. These names may sound weird or mysterious to you, I totally love it, but behind them are basically some university professors, PhD students and other academics. I think most of them are also part of Shellfish, but yeah. Then we have this bag with stuff. So first we have a lanyard for the badge here. This CD I believe contains the DEF CON soundtrack, a pretty neat gimmick. Then we have a booklet with all the information about DEF CON 26, the schedule, the talks, all the events around it and generally contains everything you need to know. Here's a page about the CTF. Then we have some stickers from this awesome art and finally the DC26 badge. The Dark Tangent presents DEF CON 26. If we put in some batteries, the front lights up with what I believe was a game. There are some controls, but I haven't looked into it at all. I later heard that you can solve small puzzles and challenges to unlock a different color for the letters. Cool. So now it's the morning of the CTF. We have set up everything in the suite, everybody is ready, our services are deployed and running. Now we just wait for the start. Then we finally get the rules. I won't go over everything in detail, you can read it yourself here, but just a few notes. First of all, there are hours, so only during this time the network was open for attack and defense. But that doesn't mean you had nothing to do at night. In fact, you used that time to keep working on exploits and patches for some challenges to have them ready in the morning. So each team got an ethernet cable they could extend with some switches. Based on those isolated networks, each team could simply visit 101002 and that service then knew which team it is. So no need for usernames and passwords. The game proceeds in ticks of a fixed time. At the beginning of a tick, new flags will be distributed to our services. Successful exploitation and redemption of this flag will increase your score and decrease the score of others. 
And this CTF also had another twist. To further your prosperity, the order has developed not one but two types of services, attack and defense and king of the hill. King of the hill was pretty cool, they were more like programming challenges. You compete against other teams for the best solution, which depends on the service in question. And that could be shortest, fastest, almost complete or whatever. Not all services were available from the start. They were slowly released one at a time and also deprecated after a while. That was indicated with colors, green, yellow and red. So if you have sunk a lot of time in a challenge and it turns yellow, you might want to switch to something else as the points you would get in the remaining time is maybe too little. For each tick you were not exploited by a team, you would get defense points for it. And if you got and submit a flag for another team, you would get attack points. And King of the Hill also gave points the longer you were at the top of that leaderboard. Later points were normalized and weighted accordingly. Patching was also very interesting. We didn't have access to our services or machines directly. The only way to interact with our own machine was by uploading a patched binary version. And then the system would run certain functionality tests to ensure your binary still is functioning properly, so you can't just reject any input. And also often patches were limited to a certain amount of bytes, so that required very careful planning in what and how to patch it. And if you would deploy some kind of superman defense, you might get punished for it by revoking your ability to patch. Of course, denial of service and so forth is not allowed and if you violate these rules you might even get banned. I think during the CTF two teams were blocked from the network for a period of time as a punishment. So here's the internal interface for our team. This was right when the CTF started. We could use this form to submit flags, but of course we actually use our automated service. I don't know, but I believe somebody from us quickly looked up how the form is submitted and made that necessary change for our flag submitting service. The CTF actually started with the King of the Hill challenge. You get all the information well to reach the service and you could download the client binary. Basically it was a multiple choice command line quiz where you had to select the matching disassembly or assembly. It started pretty simple because you had the raw bytes of the opcodes and you could, and you could use a disassembly library such as Capstone. So this was mostly a programming challenge because it's kinda annoying to interact with this unsee text interface, pausing the questions and answers. But there were several ways to improve your script. At first you might write a simple version that calls the client binary and uses it to interact with the server. Then in parallel somebody might reverse engineer the client and server protocol and implement that directly to get more control and speed over solving the quiz. And then eventually you might also find bugs that allow you to advance further and further in the game which would have been impossible otherwise. So I actually quite like that concept. Another example I participated in was the OOO editor. It was a very simple editor, kind of like looked like Radare, and by simply playing around with it, executing different commands in various orders, I found what looked like a use after free issue, where it was possible to leak pointers from the heap. And the main exploitable bug was that our file content was loaded onto the heap and you could easily read or write out of bounds with negative offset numbers. But that bug was also so simple that every team had patched that very quickly and we couldn't find another one. As far as I know, each attack and defense challenge had a fairly simple bug and a much harder bug. So even if a team patched something, you had a chance to use a much more obscure and more difficult to find bug for an exploit. Overall, the amount of challenges that were released and the fact that PCAPs of the network traffic only became available very late in the lifetime of a service, the organizers managed to figure out rules that meant that having a huge team wasn't really necessary. I heard that last year analyzing PCAPs was very powerful and just required a lot of labor. So with these changes and only 1-3 to three challenges up at the same time, it was easy to manage by a team for only 8 people. And I think that really worked out well. But that also meant that me, being not the most experienced, fastest and skilled person, I couldn't really contribute much. Others were just rocking it like crazy. But I had still fun. But I was obviously not the only person that had that issue. Others just took breaks and checked out DEF CON, participated in other CTFs going on or spent time developing our own personal scoring system to quickly see if we get attacked and who has currently working exploits and so forth. The CTF platform exposed these details through an API. In the end we ended up on 5th place, which is super impressive. But I also know how skilled the people in our team are and they totally had the ability to win, but 
that's competition. Uh, a lot of things factor into who will win in the end. So I hope you liked that overview of the DEF CON CTF and that I was able to share with you how it felt like participating in it. I really hope I get another chance of doing this as I really enjoyed playing with this team. And congrats to all teams who participated and thanks to the Order of the Overflow for creating this excellent game. Going to DEF CON CTF was overall awesome and I happily paid for my trip. Nobody sponsored me. But some members from our CTF team that I played with were supported by the following companies and so thanks for making it possible and giving them the opportunity to travel to DEF CON as well. As their teammate, I really appreciate that. So thanks to Greenbone, HI Solutions, CrowdStrike, VMRay and GData.